。啊，非常兴奋，因为我们其实邀请到就是呃，欧文书整个书的一个非常伟大的大人物来帮我们做演讲。那事实上，他很谦虚的说。他是一个投入到 open source 二十五年 ，man who contributed to open source for twenty five years。啊，然后今天 Rob 会来帮，就是呃，给我们的引导主题是 the bright the bright future of SUSE and open source。所以现在让我们非常非常激烈的，我们来欢迎 Rob。好 ，OK， 掌声欢迎。Thank you very much. Can you go back there? Okay. Good. So I. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you very much for the COSCAP uh, organizers to, to have me here. And thank you very much for everybody who has helped organizing the Open Source Asia Summit, from my team and the volunteers and the board and everybody. So I'm really happy to be here and I'm going to speak to you as an open source community member who is doing this for 25 years now, uh, but also as an Open Source community member and in my third role as the president of engineering of SUSE. So personal background a little bit, uh, my day job. My, my day job is, well, maybe this is better. So my, my day job really is um, as president of engineering. I'm leading a worldwide team of 600 engineers, and we are responsible for all SUSE products um, for, the, for the delivery of these products. I myself joined SUSE in 2002. As I said, I'm also an open SUSE community member, and uh, I am still doing contributions, so I'm doing testing when we have beta versions. I'm using open SUSE myself uh, when I'm developing, which is these days unfortunately very rare. Uh, and then uh, I'm also standing here as one of the sponsors for the Open Source project. And last but not least, as I said, for 25 years I'm now involved myself in open source communities. Um, I have experience with the open source development model, but also with the business model around it. Um, and my first contact actually was during my computer science studies with something called GNU, um, which I consider part of this whole family. But then I myself joined the Linux community in 1991 and actually brought you a picture from back then. So, like you guys here coming to this Coscop for the love and open source and all your favorite community projects, I really started in Linux. And this is God, the Linux robot, our leader for the community. And this guy here, 25 years ago, that's actually me. So, that's uh, when it all started for me a long time ago. Now this morning we heard from the minister of uh, here in Taiwan, very nice speech by the way. We heard a lot about free and open source and the history and the different flavors of it. I want to present to you my very personal view with my experience over these 25 years on open source. So it might not always be academically complete, but it gives you a real life experience how I saw the open source movement. So it really starts with free and open. That's what we all care about. When we care about something, it often turns into a passion when we care very much about it. And if a group of people comes together, then it, be it becomes a culture. Now, there are different ways how this can be expressed. <laughs> On this picture, you see somebody being against something and be passionate about it. Might be against closed source, might be against a particular... Should I take this one? Okay. So, some people then um, are really passionate against something. Um, in this case, maybe against closed source, or I don't know, really. Uh, or people are passionate for something. Like this is Richard Stallman here, giving a talk in 1995, uh, going about GNU and everything else. Um, so the passion behind is really, really important. And to be successful, what you have to do is really to turn passion into three things, positive energy. We don't like negative energy in the communities. There are lots of rants and email threats and fights. They're okay, but I personally don't like them so much. They are necessary. But I much more like if people turn it into positive energy, make contributions, do the things they want to happen, and actually collaborate amongst them. So to me, this is the key indicator for a positive passion. Then with culture, you also want to turn that into three things, actually. Number one is 
if you come together as a group, define the values that really matter for you. And every community is different. You have different goals, you have a different uh, thing you're striving for. Create a project around it, and then really make sure you set the right rules, the rules that actually express your values and that protect those values. It's very important for a community to survive and to go through that exercise. What is it really that makes our community unique and special? And if you do that, you will get a happy community. That's my experience. Now, values and rules is what I said is very important from my experience in free and open source world. What does really matter behind these two words? So let's look at each of the two words. Free. This morning we heard there are many different definitions of free coming back from the very early days. The one that I personally like a lot is freedom, as in free software and the freedom of choice. It's not only about having free access to the source code or free access to something, but if you have no way to actually change it because the policy of your or the governance of your open source project doesn't allow you to change anything, or there's really only one choice, that's not a real freedom to me. So in my experience, what is really important behind the word free is that you have a freedom of choice, that you can pick between different options, and that you have the freedom to create another one, if you like another one. Some people also say they are doing open source, but actually there are some hidden um, things you have to watch out for, vendor lock-ins. We see companies that actually say, we're all open source, but in the end, all they want is that you use their stack, which might happen to be all open source, but it's their stack or nothing else. They don't give you any freedom. So from my point of view, that's an important thing to differentiate, and for me personally, very important if I join an open source community or not. Open. Well, Open really means a lot of things. First of all, you might think about open source, of course. But look at this list. It's open source, freely accessible source code. It's the right license that goes with it. It is also a development model, believe it or not. Many people talk about agile and waterfall. To me, open source, we have done this a long time ago. Continuous integration, all of that. It is really a development model. Open community is very important. We heard plurality this morning, that we welcome everybody in a community. That is really important, that you don't have to pass certain criteria or entry tickets, that everybody can just join the community. An open design process is important. If you want to feel part of the community, you want to be involved, you want to have a say in it. If somebody else sets the rule and the design and you just have to live with it, that's not a good start for getting contributions from your community. And if you want to interact with others, you better adhere to open standards and open APIs. So you publish all the protocols and all the interfaces that you're using and that others can use to interact with your community project. Ultimately though, that's my experience, it's all about being, being willing to give up control. That's really what makes an open source project successful. We see open source projects that are really dominated by one vendor or by a dictating leader or certain very strict rules. From my point of view, you have to be able and willing to give up control. Then it's when the open source project will be, be flourishing. You even have to be open to the competition and to allow differentiation. So what might be great for you might be great for you, but others might have a different view. And you have to be open to allow them to do that they can do their flavor, their additions. They might change a different color. They might add another interface. They might have customers or they might have community members that have other needs than you have. So allow them to be open, even if it's your competitors working with you on an open source project. And we at SUSE do this all the time. We work with our competitors together in the upstream kernel and many, many other projects. Contribution and governance. So this is a complicated term, but if I want to condense it down to the really, really important things is those who do the work, they should have the say. And you will see this later in the slides when Richard 
Brown refers back to that in his uh, in the slides that I included here. You really want to welcome contributions in any form. Not everybody is a great coder. We all started as bad coders with lots of mistakes. And some of us might not even be coders. We might be designers, doc writers, testers. Welcome any kind of contribution and make sure that your community is really welcoming any kind of contribution and that you give credits. If the Linux kernel boots, you get, we give credits to all the people. You know, if you look at the console, all the different companies and people who have contributed in the source code. Those credits have to be there. If you use somebody else's work, give them credit. Very important. Now the next couple of points are again my experience. So if you want your open source project to survive in the long term, you also want to watch out for the best possible code and you want to strive for that. Now that doesn't mean that the initial contribution of source code might be perfect. It never is. But you always should try to make the source code perfect over time with everybody reviewing it. Because that's really what will make it stable and give you the quality to sustain in the long run. Something Linus Torvalds said for the Linux kernel is, keep it simple and stupid. He once said, if I don't understand your patch, it's not good code. It's too complicated. So make it simple that I can understand it. And there's really something in it. If you come from the Unix world, where on the command line, very small, powerful tools are working together, that's the same thing how your open source project should be set up. So break it into digestible pieces and only accept reusable code and try to avoid one-offs. A very good example here is in the Linux kernel. A lot of the embedded folks, they started creating subtrees that were not really aligned with the main Linux kernel. And Linux did not accept them, their patches into the main kernel unless or until they had reworked them to really be coherent and following the rules of the Linux kernel. That is important. Now for a very short, I want to give just a little overview about SUSE as well, uh, because not everybody here might know SUSE. So if I condense it down to one slide, we call ourselves the open open source company. There is a real meaning behind that, because we think we really understand the open source spirit, and we work every day using that spirit, with our partners, with our community. So we are not doing things differently just because we're a business. We really believe in the open source model. We do this for 25 years, and we are actually a profitable and fast-growing vendor in the open source space. Not every open source startup is actually profitable. It's quite hard to get it right, and SUSE is doing it really well for many years. Here is a list of all the products we do, so in case you only know about SUSE Linux Enterprise Server, we have many, many more flavors of that Linux Enterprise platform. But we are now also in patch management, we're in software-defined infrastructure with cloud and with storage. We are doing containers with Kubernetes. We are even going to the application developer with uh, Cloud Foundry and, and the platform there, very new. So as I said, we really strongly believe in these things and we do them with the community and with the partners. And we share. So we share not only the source code, but also the tools that we do. And obviously, we are a sponsor, sponsor of OpenSUSE. So that's, in a nutshell, what SUSE is. And if you want to work with others, if you want to collaborate, you really have to look for a win-win situation. So we are trying to set up the relationship between OpenSUSE and SUSE, for example, as a win-win relationship. But we do the same with our partners. I talked about process automation or tools that we're sharing. And SUSE is really proud and big and really good automation tools. And we share them all with the community and with our partners. In case you haven't never heard them and have some time and are curious, here are three examples that I would really recommend you take a look at. And at the end of the presentation, I have the URLs. So one is the open build service. It is actually something that converts source code into package formats. But not only RPM, what we are using, also Debian package format, not only for SUSE Linux Enterprise and OpenSUSE, but even for other distros, Fedora and, and everybody else. So if you are a developer, a packager of a certain package, go and take a look at the open build service. It will help you a lot for you to maintain your project 
and have it built for all different hardware architectures and all different distributions. We also have released uh, and worked on, on an open test framework called OpenQA, which helps us automatically testing distributions, but it's very pluggable. You can create tests that you plug into that framework. We use this every day. And then last but not least, the third one, distribution creation and deployment being done with Kiwi, which is a tool that out of all these packages in the end creates a distro, a virtual image, a container image. So really powerful tools that we use in our enterprise world, in our business, we're making them all available to the community. So in the end, you might wonder, why does SUSE as a business exist and how are we actually different? How are we making money? Well. Here on this slide, I really try to show the difference. And for the most part, I'm showing how we collaborate, but this is really, in a nutshell, where we differ. So OpenSUSE is an independent open source project. We're a sponsor, but they're totally independent from SUSE. We are an enterprise vendor. We are in the business world. OpenSUSE focuses on developers. We focus on enterprise customers and partners. OpenSUSE has a clear community orientation. That's all about you here. We have commercial orientation, obviously, as a business. And we actually make money, and the business value we provide to our customers is that we give 24 by 7 support, where in OpenSUSE it's voluntary by the community. We guarantee response time, where in the open source community it's best effort. Maybe somebody has time and knows the answer. We have an extended life cycle of up to 13 years that we support distribution, open source, uh, OpenSUSE has a, has a shorter one. And then hardware and software certification is something that we really watch out for, work with the vendors, make sure that our distribution works on the latest service and together with the latest software. Where on the OpenSUSE side, often it works as well, but it depends on what the hardware and software vendor have actually committed upstream. There is no guarantee. So that's in a nutshell the difference. But there's a lot that we have in common and now I want to talk about OpenSUSE a bit more. So you might think OpenSUSE is a, Linux, is a free Linux distribution, but it actually has two flavors. One of them is called Tumbleweed. That is meant for the developers and the power users who really want to be at the most up-to-date version of all the different software pa uh, packages. And we built this in a rolling release. So basically every day, there's a new build that basically constantly rebuilds integrating the latest versions of all the thousands of packages that we have. In contrast to that, we also have a distribution called OpenSUSE Leap, which has a regular release cycle, which is actually sharing the core with, Open, with SUSE Linux Enterprise. And I'll talk about this in a moment. And that one is perfect for sysadmins, somebody who just wants to run a stable server somewhere, for enterprise developers who maybe want to develop for the enterprise product and the enterprise world, and then just for regular users who are just want to use a Linux system. So the next section, I'm actually um, borrowing slides and give credits to uh, Richard, who unfortunately cannot be here, the chairman of the OpenSUSE board. So you will immediately see that they have the OpenSUSE branding. So the things I talked about that we believe as SUSE in, a lot of these things you also see in the open SUSE community. These are actually the slides of the board of the community themselves. So they clearly say freedom matters. They are picking the right open source licenses, like GPL, you see here. And then they also separate between free and non-free software. They still make it available. But for example, we do not include any closed source Linux kernel drivers as a policy in our distribution. And now important for you as a contributor, if you make contributions to OpenSUSE, will SUSE own your work? No. You have the copyright of your work. So it's really your work and your copyright. I talked about that. Those who decide, uh, those who do, they should decide. We do this very much in the OpenSUSE open, uh, project. Um, our belief is, or the the open source project belief is those who are closest to upstream should make the decisions because they have the best idea what is really going on and, and best for the distro. We don't have a clear structure. It's actually coming together in a self-organized manner. Teams who are working on the same thing are trying and should work together as a team, but there's no strict rule. 
We do follow quality and common standards, but they are defined by consensus by the community, not by SUSE. And then there are willing senior contributors who are enforcing that. So I said, it's not only important that you set the rules and the values, but you also make sure that you adhere to them so that your open source project stays in a, stays in a good uh, state. And the last section here shows a lot of things we do not have, which are often things which other open source projects have, but we intentionally don't have them because we think they are not necessary. We don't have a steering committee, because those who know and do, they decide. We don't have community managers or technical boards. We don't have benevolent dictators or project managers. It's really you, the guys who do the work, who decide. The benefits of that is that the open source project can be very agile. We can respond rapidly to all the upstream changes and integrate those changes and new technologies. That gives us a lot of flexibility as individual contributors because every upstream project that we integrate into OpenSUSE is different. This is a different speed, different release cycle. So in every area we can make independent decisions. That's how actually Tumbleweed comes about. All the different subsystem maintainers, package maintainers decide when to, when to upgrade a package. And then I talked about freedom, so there are no really restrictions on finding innovative solutions. If it works and if you support it, it's in. That's how we work. There are things where we are working, uh, or there is a proof here that we're working separately and independent. So open source is totally fine to set its own direction. I think I just explained this in the previous slide. But here are also some examples where open source differs from the Linux enterprise. In OpenSUSE, you have many, many different desktop variants included, where in the SUSE Enterprise world, you usually have one default, which is GNOME. You have a different installation workflow, and so on and so forth. So there are areas where we differ, but there are lots of areas where we are working in common. And this is actually trying to illustrate to you how we are working together. So from OpenSUSE, having Tumbleweed and all the many upstream projects, we are actually inheriting upstream innovations into SUSE Linux Enterprise. We are giving back stable code, all the testing, all the hardening, all the modifications we do, back to the project and from here back to upstream. And there is a constant mutual collaboration between OpenSUSE project and the engineers at SUSE. In fact, every engineer working for me is asked to work with the OpenSUSE community. I talked about LEAP, which is really in the middle and shared between the OpenSUSE and the SUSE Linux Enterprise code base. And this shows how it actually works together. Um, so you have our upstream, which is OpenSUSE Tumbleweed. And here you take certain features out of it and then we create a release. Open SUSE Leap, in this case 42.1. And that release shares a common core of packages and configurations with SUSE Linux Enterprise 12 SP1. The same is true for this version, the same is true for this version. Now the core develops from service pack to service pack and from Leap version to Leap version. And every Leap version also gives additional new packages into the core. But something that hasn't worked so well is the versioning numbers. Okay, OpenSUSE had 42, we had 12 in service pack. So that's actually something we fixed and we also changed the policy. So the new factory first policy means that with core 15, which is leap 15.0 and SUSE Linux Enterprise 15, both are out, so you can download or buy them. We actually have first given all the code and all the features back into the upstream code stream and from there we derive the common core and that cycle that we always give our innovations first to our own upstream community is now the rule and that's where the bright future starts that's actually something new for all of you so looking into the future that means that now we can support an upgrade from OpenSUSE Leap to SLES because they share the same, the same uh, code base and we officially support that. So if you 
as a free developer, start with OpenSUSE, fall in love with open source development and work on that. And eventually later you actually are asked to set up a little family server or in your community something or at your work, you can upgrade your system and turn it into a SUSE Enterprise system and SUSE will officially support that step. So that way your way, uh, your work that you've done before in the community is not lost, you can automatically upgrade. We think this is a very strong commitment. You will not find this, for example, between Fedora and Red Hat. They don't provide that kind of upgrade. So that is new. But there's also something else new, and I have a picture of the big elephant. So uh, some changes will happen to SUSE, they were announced. So a company called EQT, will actually buy SUSE for an immense amount of value, 2.5 billion US dollars, from our current owner, which is Microfocus. After that, SUSE will be run as a self-sustained and independent company. So there will just be SUSE today. We are part of a bigger group. That's great for us because we can uh, do everything perfectly the way SUSE needs it. But the strategy, vision, the leadership team, everything else you know about SUSE will not change. Neither will change the way how we interact with the community, because I said that that's in our genes, that really how we believe in it. The deal is expected to close in early 2019, calendar 2019. And if you wonder who AQT is, actually, they will just be the owner behind SUSE, and I said nothing will really change. But they are an investor that invests into successful companies. And they turn them from being good companies into great companies by investing more money into it. This will allow us to invest more into people, into products, and also into OpenSUSE, which is another good news for all of you. And they also come with additional funding and with additional expertise, which will help us, our products, and our community. So this also is a very good step for SUSE, and nothing you should be scared about. So I want to finish by giving you two promises. Number one, our investment in OpenSUSE will not change. It will continue to be based on our business success. The more successful we are, the more we will be able to help sponsor OpenSUSE. Uh, it will be based on the needs of our enterprise customers. So a lot of the contributions you see from SUSE engineers are actually because of enterprise customer needs. It will continue to be um, based on our belief in working closely with upstream and also a lot of personal involvement like myself and my engineers in their free time we will continue to contribute to OpenSUSE because we want OpenSUSE to be successful and to stay successful. And the second promise is we will not change the control. EQT doesn't really control SUSE and we will not control OpenSUSE, nothing will change there either. So you will have to control, if you do the work, you will have to say in OpenSUSE, and we actually encourage that, and we want that, and that will not change. So with that, I want to thank you all. Thank you all for being open source enthusiasts um, and working on all the different open source projects. I see all the different tracks here, very interesting open source projects. So thank you for all your energy you put into that. That's really great, and I love it. I want to personally thank the OpenSUSE community members for all the work they put into OpenSUSE. And then I want to help uh, thank all the organizers of COSCAP and of the OpenSUSE Asia Summit this year and the previous years, because that's really a vibrant community. And I'm very proud of you guys, what you're pulling off here in Asia. Really great work. So with that, I want to applaud to you and thank you for all of that. And on my last slide, I've just put together a couple of URLs for you in case you want to follow up, come to some of our talks, visit our booth, look for a job, talk to us if you're interested in the technology, all of that. With that, thank you for your attention and see you in the next two days.